All right, good morning. Welcome to the um, 2023 Justice Center Summit, our first session on updates from the Justice Center. We're joined today by our Executive Director, Denise Miranda, our Executive Deputy Director, Laura Darman, and our Assistant Chief of Investigations in Region 3, which is out in Western New York, for those of you who don't know our regions, Anthony Fistola. So before we begin, some Zoom housekeeping for everyone. Okay, so this is a webinar and all participants are muted and off camera. So please look at the control bar at the bottom of your screen um, and take a look at the icons. If you don't see it right away, just um, scroll your mouse down and you will be able to see uh, the different icons. We will be taking questions through the chat function of the um, of Zoom today, and we will take questions throughout the session. We'll stop at the end of section. So as you have questions, type them in the chat and we will, um, we will do our best to answer them. Uh, to view closed captioning or have a live transcription during the webinar, you can also uh, click on the closed caption icon uh, to do this. This webinar is being recorded and it will um, be posted on the Justice Center website later this uh, month or early next month. And um, I think that's it for me. So happy Zooming and I'm gonna turn it over to Executive Director Denise Miranda. Thank you, thank you, Davin. And good morning to everyone. Welcome to our 2023 Justice Center update. So we'll start that again. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Justice Center um, Summit for 2023. It is a pleasure to be here. My name is Denise Miranda, and I'm the Executive Director of New York State Justice Center. As some of you may know, uh, this year we will be celebrating our 10-year anniversary, and there have been many changes over the course of the 10 years. I like to say that the agency really has been in a process of evolution. But some things remain constant and will never change, and that is our vision and our mandate to ensure that vulnerable people can live a life free from abuse and neglect. We accomplish this through our investigations, but there are a host of other initiatives, which we'll speak about later, that really contribute to supporting this mission. An integral part of this vision is also ensuring that we're supporting and recognizing the dedicated workforce. Without the workforce, our work would be impossible. It is a partnership that we value. And we recognize that there are countless individuals out there who are doing critically important work, taking care of loved ones, taking care of people under very difficult circumstances. I would be remiss if I did not mention our Code of Conduct Awards. Um, this is an opportunity for you to nominate an individual who you believe has shown exceptional, um, exceptional commitment to providing care to vulnerable people. The deadline for that nomination is June 30th, 2023. You can get more information regarding the process of nominating, but it is really a lovely um, event that we host here at the Justice Center every week. And again, it takes, uh, it gives us a moment to really acknowledge and recognize the countless acts of commitment and courage that exists every single year. So we encourage you to please send in your nominations. So while I spoke about our commitment and the mandate to investigating abuse and neglect, we are also extremely committed to ensuring that we are preventing um, abuse and neglect. And we do this in a host of different ways. We analyze the trends, the data, the information that we collect here at the agency. And those trends inform our decisions with respect to our priorities for abuse and prevention. Recently, we developed a toolkit on medical emergencies. You can find more information on medical emergencies on our website. But we recognize the importance of emphasizing these important topics. What we do know is that, unfortunately, delays in reporting can really result in tragic circumstances. We want to ensure that we're providing providers and staff an opportunity to really do self-assessments, to receive additional resources for training, and make sure that they're adequately supported in their jobs every single day. So I would encourage you to please look at our prevention uh, materials. They're located on our Justice Center website. And again, uh, our toolkit on medical emergencies is our most recently released toolkit. As we emerge out of this two, two and a half years of a global pandemic, we are recommitting and re-engaging with providers. 
Um, we're hosting a series of roundtables. We have been doing this since last fall. And it's important to make sure that we're engaging with the providers and the people who are doing the work every single day. The goal of these discussions is simple and clear. It's to get feedback about the work that we're doing. It allows us to, dis to discuss and um, prioritize different initiatives for improvement with respect to reporting and other operations here at the Justice Center. And we find these conversations to be extremely meaningful and helpful when we look at how we can refine our process to ensure that we're operating in a way that's consistent with our mission, but also supporting the work and the providers that are out there. We're also engaged consistently with parents and families. We know that family engagement is an important part of the work we do here, and we are continuing our engagement series. We are also, and I'm happy to share with you, we'll be having a series of sessions this fall, um, October 16th, 17th, and 18th, that are specifically targeted towards family members. This will be an opportunity for questions and answers, as well as information regarding family-specific uh, resources that we have here at the Justice Center. The Justice Center here has an individual and family support unit dedicated to providing support um, to families. And we want to make sure that all families are aware of those resources. They can provide referrals. They can provide information on the process of an investigation and also really just ensure that they're providing support through investigations, recognizing that investigations of abuse and neglect can be particularly challenging um, and stressful. And we want to make sure that we are able to provide as much information and transparency as possible. When we talk about priorities, you know, we talk about what are the most difficult cases here at the Justice Center? You know, what do we want to focus on? And we have these conversations, we look at which are the cases that are most difficult. In past years, we focused on sex abuse cases, recognizing that sex abuse is particularly prevalent among vulnerable populations in care. We are now taking a good look at injuries of unknown origin. And these cases too are very, very complicated because of the circumstances regarding an injury where the origins are completely unknown. What we've done is formulated a cohort of professionals here at the Justice Center to work within a collaborative model to make sure that we're reviewing these cases. So that team consists of medical professionals, uh, investigators, and some of our legal staff. And we're able to really make sure that we're giving the appropriate attention and dedication and resources to these cases, recognizing, again, that these are more complicated cases when we do not have an answer as to how did an individual get injured. We're also implementing our three business day review, which has been an initiative that we had here at the Justice Center for quite a few years. But it also gives us an opportunity to gather information so that when we're making a classification, we're making the most, in, uh, the most accurate classification as possible. And those three business days um, allow us to get additional information, uh, to speak with providers, to get paperwork, to ensure that the case is appropriately classified. Last but not least, Justice Center is on LinkedIn. Uh, we have decided to dip our toe into the world of social media, I would ask, uh, that you please look at our page. There are a host of different resources and information regarding the work that we do. Um, there's information about the populations we serve, about our internal processes, um, lots of information on LinkedIn. Please go to LinkedIn, support the page. I can promise you that you will learn quite a bit about the day, the ins and outs of our operations as well as the work that we do. Denise, there were, thank you. There was um, one question, <clears throat> and that is, will the people receiving services in non-certified settings ever fall under the protection of the Justice Center? Will the people receiving services in non-certified settings, if the people, if individuals are outside of our jurisdiction, which is setting-based, um, licensed, operated, or certified, then they will not be under the jurisdiction of the Justice Center. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Director Miranda. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to talk a little bit about the Justice Center's priorities for 2023. You know, as Ms. Miranda said, we're approaching our 10 year anniversary and it has allowed us an opportunity while we spent the first decade really building the agency and our processes and constantly fine tuning them. We've been able to devote additional and I think more significant resources to the very important area of abuse prevention. 
Our website has a host of resources in this area, and our goal over the next year is really to develop additional prevention tools and resources and to really increase awareness about those resources. As Ms. Miranda mentioned, we now have a LinkedIn page. That's one way of doing that, but we're also taking a look at how can we overhaul the materials themselves to make them as accessible as possible to the broad audience of state agencies, facilities providing services, family members, individuals receiving services. The goal is to make them more interactive, a little bit more palatable. We have a lot of attorneys on our staff, a lot of folks who um, write a lot, and they're very um, dense at the moment. And so we're looking to break them apart and really make them more accessible for everyone. They are wonderful tools based on the data that we see in the cases we, we look at every day. There are systemic reviews posted on our website. There's there's a whole host of abuse prevention tools, including our spotlight on prevention, where we focus on specific issue areas. So I certainly encourage you to take a look at the website and you'll see more resources being developed around abuse prevention. I also just want to note that we're continuing to provide professional boundaries training. This is one of our most popular trainings. If you have not taken our pretty incredible interactive training that's available on our website, I certainly encourage you to consider taking it, to making it available if you're a provider or state agency to your staff. It's a great way to really take a look at how is our behavior every day in interacting with individuals receiving services that most professional it can be and maintaining boundaries that are healthy for everyone. And I should also plug for those of you that are licensed case acts or social workers, we have credentialing approved for these programs. I also want to talk a little bit about what is a constant priority here at the agency is improving investigations. We've spent a lot of time over the past really five years diving in and trying to ensure consistency in how we at the Justice Center do our investigations. But I think it's well known that some of our investigations are less serious investigations are delegated to state and provider agencies while they come back to the Justice Center for review. So one thing that we continue to focus on is how can we improve the consistency of those investigations, make sure that the elements in the law are met, that evidence is gathered and collected in an appropriate manner. So we're going to be doing a three-day basic investigation skills trainings a couple of times this year. You'll see on the screen that there's four times we're offering this training. These are always hugely popular trainings. I know often there's a lot of turnover at provider agencies in the quality assurance departments and other areas. So it's a great basic reset on what the expectations are for an investigation when it is delegated to a provider agency and a way to ensure consistency before it comes back to the Justice Center for final review. And you can find more information about these trainings on our website. As a second part of improving investigations, we're also focusing on not as much, you know, I just mentioned the sort of basic three-day training, but this will also be focusing on some topic areas like professional boundaries, developing a good corrective action plan. That's something we view as a very powerful tool, even on cases where we may not substantiate a case. There's often um, room for improvement in terms of how uh, agency has policies or how an incident could have been handled. So I really you know, do encourage you to participate in these free trainings. We're offering them um, in July and then again in November. And I also want to talk a little bit about an initiative that we took on um, over the past year, really, which was to, to make use of some new technology, which I guess it's not that new. I'm probably dating myself virtual reality um, technology, but we're looking at it in a different way. How can we train our own investigators on the variety of incidents that they might face um, that are in the settings under our jurisdiction? So we have this training available where it's a way that we're training our own staff on how to conduct investigations and also hope in the future to make it available to provider agencies as well as a tool to really immerse an individual in a scene and say, okay, how could I respond to this situation in the best way possible? I also wanna talk a little bit about an area of our work that is not maybe as well known to folks who are more familiar with our abuse and neglect jurisdiction under um, our authority in the statute. So the Justice Center has always had um, a responsibility to review the quality of mental health care um, that is received by individuals um, in solitary confinement in our state prison system. That authority, uh, frankly, predated the Justice Center. It was something that the Commission on Quality of Care um, undertook, and the Justice Center um, took on when we were created in 2013. About two years ago, the legislature passed a much more expansive piece of legislation, which really significantly expanded the Justice Center's oversight into prison settings. So now we're not just looking at the quality of mental health care in solitary confinement. There are 
strong new protections for um, incarcerated individuals around when they can be in solitary confinement and when they cannot. And it is our job to look at those standards, to look at the disciplinary processes um, for when incarcerated individuals receive disciplinary sanctions. And we are out visiting um, prisons. We have staff out this week. Um, I know um, visiting prisons and our goal is to get to all prisons. We have a sort of a staggered plan um, over a two-year period. We also are working on an annual report regarding our work in the forensic space, and that will be hopefully available on our website in the next month or so. But right now you can find on our website um, the facility reports from the oversight that we do um, in these prison, system, prison systems in New York State. And so it's an oversight over docs and the Office of Mental Health and the care that's provided to incarcerated individuals. So that's another resource available on our website. And since I've been talking so much about our website and the resources available, I wanted to just highlight some of the things that we do make available on our website. I think one thing that we really try to do, particularly under um, the administration, the Hochul administration, is really to expand what we can talk about our work. We think it's really important to shine a spotlight on the work that we do. Um, we have monthly data reports available on our website. Our annual report is available for viewing for 2022. And I think that's a great resource for folks that are not as familiar with our work or are you know, newer to the Justice Center. It's a really nice synopsis of both initiatives that we've undertaken in the past year, and also just a basic primer on how our processes work. There are many complicated aspects to the Justice Center's work, um, and it's a nice synthesis of all of that work. You'll also see on our website, systemic reviews and of uh, facilities and programs. We talked a little bit ab about our abuse prevention work. This is a great example. I think our systemic reviews are some of our most powerful tools in terms of identifying a problem that we see in multiple facilities or programs and suggesting corrective actions. We're very lucky to have our state agency partners like OPWDD and OASIS take these findings very seriously and often implement corrective actions on a much larger scale to address the systemic issues identified. So those reports are also available on our website. And then, as I mentioned, our forensic monitoring reports. So those are a wealth of information about the forensic work that we do. And I think you'll find that the website, you know, we continue to constantly try to improve it to make this information more accessible and our work more transparent. And to that end, we've created a new tab on the website you see highlighted here with a red arrow for reports. So this will give you an, an easy one-stop spot to go to look at reports about our work. And I'll pause there to see if there's any questions before there, I turn it over. Thank you. There are a couple of questions. Of um, we have a follow-up question. Uh, from the person who wanted to know if people under non-certified settings would ever be under our jurisdiction and they want to know if if that's possible that that could ever happen that there could be so, um, an addition great question davin and i think what's really important to underscore here is the justice center does not have control over who is under our jurisdiction we were created we're a creature of statute so the legislature is responsible for you know, creating settings under our jurisdiction. So I think that that's a great advocacy point for folks who are concerned about the scope of our jurisdiction. That's something that the legislature needs to create for us. Thank you. Um, I have, uh, I wanna make a, an announcement because there were some questions. Uh, this PowerPoint presentation and a recording of this presentation will be available on the Justice Center website. So if you joined late, you will be able to see this, um, you know, at a later point in time. So fear not. Um, there was also a question if uh, our, we could make our recording of our professional boundaries training available uh, so providers can get a copy. We actually have something that you can grab from our website and use, and it has a study guide with it. Um, and if, you know, you want to talk to us further, you can uh, contact us uh, after the um, session. And the last question, Laura, I'm not quite sure how to answer this question or um, what the context is, but somebody asked, how do we find pro bono information for attorneys? So I'm not sure if folks are asking about information for volunteering. You know, there's, as a licensed attorney, there are opportunities to do pro bono work for CLE credit. Um, that is not something that we're currently doing or offering as an agency. We have CLE accreditation for our own staff, um, but maybe someone could follow up with us offline and we could just get a little bit more context about the question so I can okay. answer it. Great. And there was one last question. I'm just going to, um, somebody wants to know about, um, you know, 
reporting when people are in the family shelter system, which is not under the Justice Center's jurisdiction, um, and you know they would report to Adult Protective Services. Family shelters are not under the Justice Center. Um, abuse and neglect should be continue to be referred to the Adult Protective System. And that's it for the questions for now. Okay, thank you, Devin. Anthony, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Ms. Darman. Good morning, everyone. This portion of the presentation will go over statistics and trends that we saw last year. Uh, there were 86,699 calls made to the DPCR last year. Of those calls, 12,602 were classified as abuse neglect, 1,709 for death, 25,862 significant incidents, over 35,000 were classified as non-JC incident, and a little over 11,000 were not considered incidents in our system. We observed an increase in significant incidents, abuse and neglect reports, and substantiated cases from 2021 to 2022. 2022, there were 12,602 abuse and neglect reports and 3,217 substantiated cases. Out of the 3,217 substantiated cases in 2022, there was 1.5% determined to be category one, 22% category two, 75% determined to be category three, and 1.5% as category four finding against the provider. Approximately 33% of abuse and neglect allegations are substantiated. Out of the 3,217 substantiated reports, 2,408 were category three, 699 were category two, and the remaining substantiations were either a category one or a category four case. The most substantiated allegations seen in both state operated and non-state operated facilities were for neglect, 93% state up and 85% in non-state up. Physical abuse substantiated cases was 9% in state up and 21% in non-state up while obstruction was relatively equal with 4% and 5%, as well as psychological abuse with 2% and 3% respectively. Sexual abuse substantiations was 0.2% in state op, while hovering at 2% in non-state op facilities. These percentages were based on total cases closed. They may contain, cases may contain more than one substantiated allegation. This time, we're going to go ahead, go ahead, go forward with a quick break and stretch, uh, approximately five minutes, unless there are any questions. I have one question. Um, in the reports that were made to the Justice Center, do those include uh, reports that are made were made by OPWGD providers about COVID cases? They do, yes. Thank you. We no longer take those calls anymore, though. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So, thank you. Um, and the one last question. Um, when you mentioned classification breakdown on the first slide, are those classifications prior to the three-day business protocol or after, um, after things have been reviewed? The classification should be after the three business day review. Correct. Yep. Um, and, uh, I believe, oh, there was a question about explaining the difference between the categories of abuse and neglect, the findings between category one, two, and three. So category ones are, are the most serious offenses, um, something like sex abuse. Example of a cat two finding would be serious physical abuse with injury. You know, someone punched someone, there's an injury. Uh, category threes are what we see the most of, uh, you know, supervision, lack of supervision. Uh, category four example is issues are systemic in nature, possible inadequate training, um, inadequate management, supervision. Okay. I, hope, I hope that helps with the categories. Thank you, Anthony. Um, I'm, Devin, I would yep. just also note that for folks who want some more specific information that's not too lawyerly, the annual report actually has a good breakdown of the categories in their descriptions. And okay. also, if anyone's having some trouble sleeping at night, um, you can read our ALJ decisions, which are you know redacted to not disclose personal information, but also can be sorted by category <clears> level <throat> to give you some examples of the type of conduct we're talking about. Yes, um, and, and our monthly reports also have examples as well. Um, I know some people are anxious for a break, but there are um, a lot of questions coming in. And um, 
one of them was about the virtual training for providers, if it would be, or the virtual training that we've developed, will it be available for providers this year? Um, I, I don't think so. As soon as it is available, we would, we will certainly Absolutely. let people know. Um, and, um, and so, uh, you know, the, I, I would, there's some questions about the data. I think it's a good idea to go back and maybe look at our um, annual report and our monthly reports. They explain, we use the term substantiated and unsubstantiated. And so you can see that um, uh, they are very clearly. And um, there was a question about what is the difference between a non-justice center incident and a not an incident So report. I think the, the sort of easiest way to describe that is there are things that could be a uh, potential problematic incident but does not meet the definition of abuse or neglect or a significant incident or is potentially not under our jurisdiction, but we're gonna make, no matter what, any report that comes to our hotline, any call or any web report, it, it gets classified. And if it's not under our, you know, if it's under our jurisdiction, it's not under our jurisdiction, the appropriate state agency gets a notification about the incident. Um, not an incident could be things like someone call, you know, or a hotline. So sometimes people call and ask for directions, um, have more general questions about the system, which are really not recording an incident of something happening, but more asking questions. So that's kind of, I guess, the simplest way to describe it. And the other thing I would just mention, Dava, with respect to questions about our process, substantiation, unsubstantiation, just a plug that we have many more summit sessions coming up this week where we'll dive more into those details and weeds. And these will all be, again, on our website recorded. So our great resource to go back and look into. Thank you. Um, and also, you know, there was a question about the reports. We had the, the slide that had the number of reports the Justice Center received. And then we had a slide about the percentage that are substantiated. So the reports are the actual reports that we receive. And as Anthony said, we tend to substantiate around 32, 33% of the allegations that we receive um, each year. And um, so that is, um, I think that's it. Let's take a break. Hi, welcome back everyone. We received a couple of questions during the break um, that I just wanna uh, ask before we go on to the next section. Uh, the first was when an incident gets sent to another state agency because it's not under our jurisdiction, does the person who makes the call get notified about that? No, I don't, I mean, I think typically we're gonna make the classification um, and the expectation is that there's follow-up by the state agency regarding the incident. Um, but I don't think that's something we proactively notify individuals about. Thank you. And um, there, there was a question about the notification process for um, provider agencies about, say, uh, an agency that's licensed by the Office of Mental Health. How do they and how soon do they find out if an incident was not classified as a justice center incident? So we take calls, a typical call is about 20 minutes. Um, also, if anyone's interested, we have recorded calls on our website, um, just as an example of the types of questions or the kind of the cadence of a call. But we take those calls, classification is made, and what we call um, in, in our agency an F9, but a notification from our system is sent to the Office of Mental Health, um, usually within an hour, sometimes less. Um, and that notification is transmitted um, through the NIMR system to providers um, immediately so that appropriate safety notifications can be put in place. I think it's also important to stress that in a lot of these settings, it is the provider staff calling to report an incident. Um, so emergency response measures have already been taken um, and people are usually aware that an incident has happened. That's not always the case, but I also should note that that is a factor at play as well. But these notifications happen 24-7 you know, we operate a 24-7 call center. They go through the system. There are appropriate staff at all state agencies to monitor these notifications and ensure that providers are putting safety plans into effect. Okay. I'm going to ask two more questions before we go on. Um, and so is there, you know, when uh, an allegation is made that is not truthful, do we have a special process for that? So I think this is a wouldn't do a justice center presentation without getting a question of that nature. So I think the challenge is we operate a call center where we have to make classifications at face value based on the information that is shared with us. 
So we're going to make a classification based on the information that is shared. It is difficult to know when it is being shared, if it is false or not, which is why we have the three business day review process. So it allows us to send information through a more robust classification process to try to determine that we're making the best possible classification. There might be a point in within that process to realize that it is you know, false or um, not factual, but I think it's also important to remember that we receive reports of individuals receiving services from staff members, from members of the public, and it is our job to make a classification based on the facts in front of us, and then to, if it is determined that we think the allegations rise to abuse and neglect, to conduct an investigation. We have processes both on the front end to try to ensure appropriate classification, and then to expedite a case, for example, if we believe that the information is materially false. And depending on you know, what that, that looks like, you know, sometimes it's um, staff members can make reports that are false, individuals receiving services can make reports that are false, and there are various protocols that we work with state agencies on when we believe that to be the case. Okay, um, thank you. There's a couple more questions, but I'll ask them at the next break. Thanks, Devin. Welcome back to our 2023 Justice Center Summit. This part of the presentation will go over resources for investigations. This map breaks down the five Justice Center regions across the state. Region one is covered by Assistant Chief Carol Cassell. Region two, Central New York, is covered by Assistant Chief Mike Bailey. Myself, Anthony Pistola, covers the western part of the state, which is considered region three for the Justice Center. Chief, Assistant Chief Eric Fisher covers Region 5, and Assistant Chief Christina Rodhan covers Region 4. Our contact information is present on the slide with any, with any uh, questions you may have. Uh, uh, updated guidance for staff. So we have updated guidance for staff on our website, justicecenter.ny.gov. If you go to the Providers and Staff tab, there is guidance for reporting incidents the investigative process, and the appeals process, as well as resources for success, which includes our toolkits for spotlight on prevention and additional training opportunities, which will be touched upon in future slides. Uh, another unit <laughs> that we have that works with investigators is our individual and family support unit, also known as IPSU. These advocates interact with and assist and guide individuals and families through the reporting, investigation, final determination and criminal processes. They have the ability to make referrals and serve as liaison, provide accompaniment services and conduct outreach. At times they come out with our, our investigators and are present for interviews with the individuals. At this point, I will now pass it to Executive Director Miranda unless there's any questions regarding this. We do have a, a few questions. Um, our first question is, are providers expected to put people out on leave as part of a safety plan after an allegation has been reported? I'm happy to take that, Anthony. So there, this is something that we frequently get asked. The Justice Center does not make decisions about administrative leave. That is a decision that is made by the state agency with the provider agency who knows the circumstances best. Um, and we encourage you to think about the safety of all folks involved. You know, what is your staffing ratio? Those are all decisions that providers need to make based on the circumstances presented. The Justice Center does not make decisions about administrative leave. Okay, thank you. Um, can a provider request that an incident go through the three business day review? Yes. We have an incident review mailbox. Um, that is a resource that we can uh, make sure is available. Providers do frequently ask, you know, they can ask that. It has to meet the criteria for three business day review. I'm not going to guarantee that we would agree, but we certainly are willing to look at incidents and take that into account and have dialogue with providers. Okay. And the last question is, uh, do we have a plan to address frequent callers? or as we call them here, familiar, familiar callers. callers. <laughs> so we, we do have a plan. This is not a new issue for us. As you may imagine, as a call center, we, we have um, several folks in our system that are known to us as familiar callers. We work with the individual and family support unit, as Anthony just mentioned, with the state agencies, whether that's the Office for Mental Health, the Office for People with Developmental Disabilities, OCF, um, OASIS, any of those um, state agencies, we work with them for how to identify familiar callers and ensure that they're getting the support they need on the ground. A lot of times we find that there's a behavior going on 
or an incident, um, and we work with the state agency and in concert with the provider or the facility to deal with familiar callers. And again, I think it's important to stress IFSU as a resource. Um, these folks are really wonderful, dedicated advocates, social workers who can work with families too to help sometimes mitigate um, some of the behavior prompting um, frequent calls. One last question. If a staff member is alleged to have stolen money from a youth in care, will the Justice Center investigate this or is this a police matter? Oh, good question. So it's a little hard to say, you know, without all the facts and circumstances, everything's individual, but I would always encourage someone to report that to our hotline and we can make appropriate classification. I think it could potentially stray into a breach of um, supervision, which could be neglect, um, but we don't typically have jurisdiction over financial issues. And I certainly think if someone's on the fence, you can report that to local law enforcement as well. There's nothing stopping um, an agency. We don't make decisions about what should be reported to local law enforcement. Okay, Executive Director Miranda. Thank you, Davins. So as I mentioned earlier today, we consider training and outreach to be an integral part of our prevention efforts. Our website, www.justicecenter.newyork.gov, has many different videos available. There are videos regarding our overview, an overview of our mission uh, and vision, resources to prevent abuse and neglect, and also videos explaining what to expect during an investigation. Our code of conduct is a written document that must be signed by all staff and volunteers. It sets forth the requirements of all staff and volunteers with respect to the expectations for care that is offered that are offered to individuals who are receiving services. It outlines obligations for mandatory reporting, and it also directs custodians to call 911 in emergencies. It's an important part of the onboarding process and we require for all staff, all custodians, volunteers included, to sign this when they commence employment. Recognizing the importance of the code of conduct, we do offer a train the trainer series, and those sessions are going to be held virtually this year, March 22nd, April 26th, and May 24th. Professional boundaries interactive training. So because of because we discussed um, earlier the fact that our work is informed by trends and data as well as feedback from providers, we often will look at the need to develop specific topic-specific trainings. Recently, we developed a professional boundaries interactive training, and that training is available on our website. It explains why professional boundaries are a critical part of providing excellent care. Additional training resources. So as I've mentioned now several times, our website is chock full of all sorts of resources, and I would encourage you again to please look at our website. Um, we do offer in-person training. We also do webinars like this one. If you're interested in receiving a training for your staff, please reach out to us. There is an email at the bottom here, jctraining at justicecenternewyork.gov. We offer trainings on mandated reporting, on investigations, uh, VPCR use, as well as trainings that are specific for family members and advocates. Prevention abuse. So prevention is an important component of our work, and I continue to emphasize that because we are more than just an investigatory unit. On our website, you will find resources for a spotlight on prevention. And our spotlight on prevention offers toolkits. There are currently eight toolkits that are available for you to view. Those toolkits include self-assessment tools, case studies, as well as best practices. These are different um, topics that, again, are selected based on trends that we're seeing, data that we collect in the VPCR. Some of those toolkit topics include dangers of caregiver fatigue, medical emergencies, which I discussed earlier, maintaining professional boundaries, which I just discussed, um, as well as others like securing wheelchairs and vehicles. Again, these are really wonderful resources that are available to providers and to staff so that they can provide optimal care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I have a uh, couple of questions and I want to remind because I guess some people are still logging on. This, sem this uh, session will be, is being recorded and will be available on our website. So um, don't worry if you missed the beginning. Um, and uh, 
there is a question about the code of conduct, if it's uh, meant for people who are, say, a board member of an agency, but not patient facing. The code of conduct is intended for people who have regular and substantial contact with people receiving services. So unless your board members are, um, you know, volunteering and working directly with people, they would not need to sign the code of conduct, though there's nothing wrong with them taking a look at it. Um, and the last question is, can providers get a list of incidents that have been uh, reported, you know, about their agency and then the results of those? So providers are given notifications regarding all incidents of abuse and neglect that results in an investigation. So that information um, is in their possession already. When an investigation is concluded, they will also be provided with information regarding the conclusion, i.e. whether that case was substantiated or unsubstantiated. If there's additional information that is being requested, my suggestion would be to please reach out to us to see whether that's information that statutorily we're permitted to share with the provider. Thank you. Um, and then there's uh, a question about um, the train the trainer uh, dates for the code of conduct. All of our training dates, everything you can find on our Justice Center website. So after this um, session, I encourage you to go on the website and find all of the resources that we are going through right here and you can find those dates. Uh, I have no other questions. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Director Miranda. So I'm just going to conclude our formal presentation and talk a little bit about some of the community resources that we have available um, at the Justice Center. Justice Center. So first, I want to talk about a really excellent program that is often not well known, but I encourage all of you to take a look at the information on our website about the trade program, which is really a goal of increasing access um, to technology, um, assistive technology for the general population. And that could be in areas of education, employment, whether it's um, needing a laptop or an iPad or potentially a wheelchair or a ramp. The trade centers are an amazing resource. They are, there are 12 of them located around New York State. We have a wonderful coordinator here at the Justice Center who um, oversees this work and works with us um, to pass through um, federal money to support this program. So please, Take a look um, if you know anyone who's in need of assistive technology. They have helped out in so many situations, you know, grandparents visiting individuals with disabilities struggling to, to get access to adaptive technology. It's a wonderful program and we encourage everyone to make use of it and to talk about it more broadly within your community. Um, I also want to talk about some of the resources that we have on our website. I know we've heard that a lot this morning, but it really is a good place to find resources. Uh, we are required under the law to host a clearinghouse or um, sort of a warehouse of information about dis disability resources. This is a great page on our website that has everything from housing resources to education to food assistance. It's a, a wide variety of information posted um, on our disability resources page. And then I also want to talk a little bit about another unique program that we have at the agency, which is the Surrogate Decision Making Committee program. So this is a program that helps to avoid, frankly, the guardianship process through the court system, which can be very onerous um, and take a really long time and be very expensive. It was a program created over 20 years ago for former residents of OPWDD, OMH or OASIS programs um, are eligible for it. And it's a way to expedite um, a process for consent for significant medical decisions. So if someone needs surgery, something that is not emergency in nature, biopsy sometimes, all sorts of different programs uh, or requests like that come through our program. We usually handle about a thousand of these requests a year. We've done a lot of adaption over the past couple of years to adapt the, the environment in the pandemic to make things um, easier to participate in for hospitals, for doctors, for individuals receiving services and provider facilities. We know a lot of providers under our jurisdiction already make use of the SDMC program, but please check out our website. There's more information there and I'm gonna make a shameless plug for volunteers. The program really works by sending an application forward for consent for medical treatment to a panel of four volunteers who hear the, the request and make a decision. We need attorneys, social workers, family members, individuals receiving services as volunteers. So we're always looking for new volunteers. We have a really great number of folks, um, and I think we even recognize them this month because it's a volunteer recognition month, but they're a great bunch of folks and are always looking for new volunteers. So check out the application on our website for a little bit more about that program. And then I'll just conclude by giving everyone some contact information. We've talked a little bit about the hotline. The number is right up at the top. 
Information and referral is another great place to call if you're not sure who you need to connect with at the agency if you have a question. Those folks are great on the hotline. Is that the information referral line is staffed Monday through Friday, nine to five. Obviously the hotline, the abuse neglect hotline is 24 seven. And our individual and family support unit is another great resource that we've talked about today. And then obviously at the bottom, the 518 number is more of a general line, but I would encourage folks to call information or referral if you have a more general question and aren't sure where that should be directed. At the bottom is our website, which we've talked about quite a bit. And then I'll stop and see if there are additional questions. And of course there are. Um, there, a few people have asked if the Justice Center provides any in-person training for uh, provider agencies or staff, and the answer to that is yes. And this slide that is up here, you can use it to contact and, uh, and make a request and we can talk about that. Um, and there was um, a question if, um, an allegation is brought to a provider's attention regarding a former staff member that is no longer employed with our organization. Does that need to be reported to the Justice Center, even if the person is no longer living in New York State? So I would just say there's no harm in making the report. I would think that the individual receiving services, if they were harmed at any point in time when the person was employed um, by your organization, that that's something that we, you know, would have the authority to investigate if it occurred within um, since 20, June 30th of 2013. So my recommendation would be to make a report if you know about an incident and then we can make a determination based on the facts presented. Okay, thank you. Um, if an investigation is assigned to the agency and the assigned investigator records an interview, can a summary of that interview be included in the final report or does the Justice Center want the actual recording of the interview? So, Anthony, do you want to jump in here? I mean, I have a response, but I'm happy to let you take the lead there. Sure, thanks, for, thanks for starting. Can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, just going back to the question. So if there's an actual interview, we always prefer the actual interview uh, in, in the audio. Uh, that way we can review it for ourselves and see what exactly what's said and if there's any other information that may come out of that interview rather than a summary. I would agree. I would also say we're working on launching over the in the fall an upgrade to our system, which is going to make it much easier for providers and staff to send us digital evidence recordings um, to the BPCR in a way that's much more seamless. I know it can often be a challenge when we have all these different systems of technology, my send and you know, all I don't even know all the things I'm not going to pretend, but like, you know, all the different ways that people send us information. So I think that'll be a, a welcome upgrade and make it much easier to send those types of recordings to us in the future. Thank you. Um, another question is, is it the Justice Center's position that a delay in reporting constitutes obstruction? Well, I think that that's very fact specific. So I think it would depend on what kind of delay we're talking about. And if the person knew about it and chose not to report, I think our general um, preference is that people make a, re a report as soon as they know about it, so within 24 hours. Um, but I think if somebody knew about an incident and really sat on it for a lengthy period of time, that could potentially be considered obstruction depending on the facts and circumstances presented. But that's very fact specific, so I don't really, I can't really give you a solid answer on that without knowing all the circumstances. Okay. Um, there are some questions about training that, uh, you know, if we do part, training for part six to five incidents. Uh, some of these things are things that your uh, state licensing agency you should be talking to. We do training on Justice Center um, processes and investigations and reporting requirements. Um, that's what we do. I'd just like to put in another plug since people keep on asking. Yes, this, um, this session is recorded. It will be on our website. It will be available to you. So um, if you missed any part of it, you'll be able to see it later. Do you have and any I don't, more questions? Nothing that hasn't really been asked before. So I think, um, oh, wait, we just got one in. Um, what is the role of the agency investigator when the allegation is called into the Justice Center pending determination and assignment? I'm sorry, I'm, I don't understand the question. So um, if, if something's been called into the Justice Center, can it, a provider agency start investigating before a determination has been made if it's abuse or neglect? and? So our general advice is to hold off until a classification determination has been made and we've communicated that to the agency. That said, and this is a very frequent question that we've gotten, 
over the past 10 years, that does not mean that a provider cannot ask questions that they need to ask to ensure a safety plan is put into place or to make decisions about administrative leave. So I think there's a big difference about trying to understand what has happened at a high level to make a report and make those decisions and then commencing interviews. You know, until you know whether the Justice Center is taking an investigation or it is delegated, it's probably best to hold off. And again, usually those determinations are made within an, you know, an hour. Um, they would be longer if it goes through the three business day review process, but it's a pretty quick process to, for us to decide classification on an incident. Okay. Here's a straightforward question. When reporting abuse or neglect, do we also need to report it to our state oversight agency like OPWDD? So that is a great question. I think, you know, one thing we hear a lot is about like redundant requirements, right? But when you're reporting something to the Justice Center, it is automatically sent to OPWTD through, in their case, the IRMA system for, for OMH, it's NIMR. So, the, you know, I, I don't want to speak specifically about the reporting requirements for OPWTD because I am not OPWTD, but reporting to us is the threshold and those those reports are communicated to OPWTD. Okay. Um Here's a question for Anthony. Why do providers have to set up interviews? Well, a lot of time we go to the providers to set up interviews uh, because they, they know the staff scheduling. They know uh, they have to, if we're interviewing a staff, usually they have to have a staff member, uh, you know, come in and take that staff member's place. So they're meeting their minimums. Uh, we, we also sometimes do set up our own interviews. Um, that where we don't get the provider involved, well, we want the provider to kind of know what's going on. So when we go into a group home, uh, an IRA, you know, a house, they know that we're there and they know that they're going to have to uh, find some some coverage for that time frame that we are there interviewing their staff members as well as interviewing the individuals. Thank you. What can provider agencies tell their staff about the role of police and the right to counsel if the JC decides an investigation is criminal? So we actually, you know, we have guidance on our website, which I would encourage um, providers to look at in terms of what are um, what to expect during an investigation. And I think, you know, when something is deemed criminal, I, I'm going to presume, although I could be wrong, so, you know, it's a little challenging in chat, but that we're talking about a scenario where the staff member's conduct is deemed, you know, criminal in nature and that there's a criminal investigation um, not when we're talking about the conduct of individuals receiving services and their behavior. So I think the important thing to remember is that the Justice Center defers to local law enforcement um, to take the lead if they're interested in taking the lead and then we'll step in. Our special prosecutor's office coordinates, you know, every day with our investigators about the process. And typically we are asked to kind of stand down like while the criminal process plays out, but there are also times where we can expect that um, our investigation, our administrative investigation can continue. We have said for many years that individual, you know, individuals who are subjects, custodians, um, are entitled to legal counsel. You know, they can bring an attorney to um, an interview. And, you know, I think it's just important to reiterate uh, that guidance that is on our website. And if there are any more specific questions, I think it's probably good to follow up offline just so we can make sure we're understanding the questions thoroughly. Thank you. Uh, once an investigation is completed by the Justice Center and the letter of determination is received, can the oversight agency question the final report? They, they do. I mean, we, those are certainly conversations that we have. Yeah, I mean, I think they, it depends on who the finding is made against. The right to appeal is really vested with the person who, with, right. who not, per, excuse me, the finding is made against. So maybe that's a provider agency if it's a category four, maybe that's an individual if it's a category one, two, or three. But certainly we have lots of dialogue with the state oversight agencies about our investigations, how we can, you know, improve them, regulatory practices. Those are very common conversations. Thank you. Can staff bring an attorney to a justice center interview? Yes, that is something that we that is on our website. Um, there are also times, depending on if a staff is in a collective bargaining unit or a union, that there'll be terms um, within that agreement that govern. So maybe it's a labor representative, but a staff member is entitled to bring an attorney to our inter interviews. Okay. There's a question about whether um, providers have to complete things in NIMERS or if the JC completes things in NIMERS about the incident. Um, you know, other than pushing the allegation, we don't do complete other fields in NIMERS. So that is something for the provider agency. Um, 
One person wants to know if an agency can challenge who the incident is delegated to. Yeah, um, we certainly encourage dialogue. Um, I think one thing that's important to remember too is like I said earlier, we're making a classification based on the information that's known to us at the time of the report, right? So we might classify something as a delegated because we believe it to be less serious. It's not in a state operated setting. It's a less serious allegation. But if the provider learns more information that changes that, then we can upgrade the classification to make it a justice center led investigation or vice versa. So I think those are important conversations to have. You know, earlier we shared the assistant chief's contact information for the regions. If for some reason, you know, things have already moving down the, the line in terms of our process, please always know you can reach out to the assistant chief with questions like that. It's important to have that dialogue sooner rather than later. Okay. Historically, what percentage of abuse and neglect allegations are delegated to provider agencies to investigate? So I don't have that percentage off the top of my head. Um, I think that we have broken that down in other data reports, but I don't know that number off the top of my head. Okay. Um, someone is seeking clarification. If a staff member who is currently employed gets a category one determination, does that um, provider need to immediately separate the person since they will be on a staff exclusion list? So they have the determination, the person mm -hmm. is on the, so technically under the law, if the person is going to appeal that category one finding, you know, it is sort of what we, you know, Held, I don't, held in advance means different things, but like for, for purposes of this conversation, I would just say the determination is not final until it goes through the appeals process. I really, you know, look to the provider to say it's up to you whether you're comfortable having someone who has a substantiated category one finding, um, whether or not you're comfortable having that individual on their staff. Technically, the law does not require separation of service until the determination is final, which is either, you know, if someone chooses not to appeal 40 days after they receive that letter or at the end of the appeal process. Thank you. Is it the provider's responsibility to notify subjects of investigations that um, an allegation has been made against them? So great question. Um, many years ago, we put into place protocols requiring that whichever investigatory agency is conducting the investigation, they are responsible for notifying folks that they will be interviewed. So if the Justice Center is leading an investigation, the expectation is we are notifying subjects of that fact and we have a template letter by which to do that. Thank you. Um, one person wants clarification. Can staff that are not subjects bring uh, a lawyer or a union rep to an interview with the Justice Center? So our position has generally been that people can bring an attorney to, you know, their interview, whether they're subjects or witnesses. I think, you know, it, it really depends on the facts and circumstances. And again, sometimes there are more specific terms in a collective bargaining agreement where that might not be allowed. But generally speaking, if, you know, staff wants to bring an attorney, they're allowed to do that. Um, there's been a few questions about the length of time of a Justice Center investigation and why it can vary so much. Um, so do you want to talk about sure. that? Uh, so having to talk about cycle time, as we call it here at the agency, it is a top priority at all times for us. We understand that the length of Justice Center investigations or any investigation when it's delegated or led by the Justice Center certainly impacts the provision of services. Um, I can just tell you that there can be a wide variety on cycle time because not every case is created equal, right? So we get a range of um, incidents reported to us, some serious and criminal in nature, some very serious non-criminal cases that can be more complicated with multiple subjects, many witnesses, and others are more straightforward. I can tell you that our average cycle time is, you know, trending down over the past 10 years. Every year it trends down, um, and our goal is certainly always to get to 60 days, or oftentimes in many cases close under 60 days, but there will be outliers. Again, if you feel like a case is taking a long time, and you haven't had, you know, especially if it's a justice led, justice center led investigation, please communicate with us. You know, if we don't know about it, our assistant chiefs can't look into it. Um, we have a very robust case management system, which allows us to track the status of cases. So it's very easy for us to figure out what's going on in a specific case. So reach out if you have questions. On delegated investigations, it's just a reminder that this is a partnership, right? We need everyone to cooperate in scheduling interviews to showing up to interviews, to providing documents. That's all part of making the cycle time move more smoothly for all investigations. So just a little plug, I always like to say when I'm asked this question, it is a partnership. We rely on all of you to help ensure that we can meet our cycle time targets as well. Great. Um, if a staff member is found to have uh, 
been substantiated for category one and works for multiple agencies, who has the responsibility to notify those other agencies? The Justice Centers makes those notifications. Okay. Um, and uh, let me see. And again, I guess just another plug for, I know we have sessions on our pre-employment check process. So there's like a lot of other good, more specific sessions this week about both the case life cycle and pre-employment checks and other things. Um, there's a question for the staff exclusion list. Do we look outside of New York State for arrests um, and federal cases? Um, so, that, we, that, yeah. yeah, I got it. So, yep. the, so a couple of things. Um, the staff exclusion list check does not, that is separate and apart from the criminal background check process. And I'm pretty sure, Devin, unless I'm wrong, there is a separate session on this later this week. So I definitely encourage This them. afternoon at 2.30. Oh, Wonderful. So um, even if someone can't attend that live, that will be recorded and on our website. And there's a lot of re resources about pre-employment checks on our website. So the staff exclusion list check is a simple check against a list that the Justice Center creates regarding category one conduct, individuals who have been substantiated for category one conduct. So, or two category twos within three years. So that is a separate check that we do. Once an individual who's seeking employment has cleared the staff exclusion list check, they go on to the, the criminal background check process. If they are cleared to work in the system and then there is a subsequent arrest out of state, we, are, we receive notifications of that. So it really depends on the circumstances, but I think in the scenario that was described, we would receive notification of an arrest um, out of state and be able to relay that to a provider. Thank you. There's a question that... Um, Sometimes at the end, there's, um, it appears to the provider that there have been offenses added to the original allegation, um, and they want to know if there's a way that the Justice Center could tell voluntary providers of all the alle allegations they are looking into, since they can't see VPCR notes. I'm assuming it might be for safety purposes. Sure. I think sometimes offenses get added at the conclusion of an investigation because an investigation uncovers conduct that wasn't known at the beginning of an investigation. So I think it is kind of dependent on the circumstances, but providers do receive the letters of determination and then the, 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 the investigative summary report at the conclusion of the investigation, which gives them all that information. I think if we're talking about a different period of time that it's a little bit challenging to communicate that you know, the classification is made on the front end and then the investigation has to happen. So I think it is kind of um, a process and can be very individually case specific. But again, I think good communication with the assistant chiefs in the regions and our supervising investigators can go a long way there if folks have questions. Right. And we'll be sending out the supervising investigators to everyone who attended this session. Um, this is the question. So if someone is substantiated for not a category one finding, um, does the Justice Center notify if that person works at multiple agencies? Do we notify those agencies that someone was substantiated for a category three, for example? No. No, we do not. Just the um, immediate employer. And we, uh, CEUs are not available for these trainings, I'm sorry. Um, and right now that looks to be the last question. Oh. Right. Handouts and survey links will be emailed to um, everybody who registered for after the summit. Uh, we'll also be sending an evaluation later on. And so we encourage you to fill that out and let us know, uh, you know, what you'd like to see more of, um, less of, and uh, how it all went for you. Okay. Thank you, Devin. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, everyone.